Are you there? Can we start? Yes. So please. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So in my last talk, I'm going to talk about the origins of the nervous system of eukaryotes and of life. And this is a seminar. It's based on a paper that has just been submitted. So, cells are complex dynamical systems that are very far from equilibrium and strongly interacting with their environment, especially with other cells. So, interactions like those are extremely important, so they must have arisen soon after the emergence of life. What are possible ways to communicate between cells? Well, one would be by extending a kind of connecting cable between them. And as you now know from my previous seminars, they exist. And these cables, I'm sorry, have been called different things. Cytonemes, TNT, tumor microtubes, and as I already said, I have a generic name for them, which is cell membrane nanotubes, abbreviated CMN. Now, I have proposed that CMN are the origin of the nervous system. The second way of communication that is possible is by encapsulation of the message in a vesicle and transmitting the vesicle. And this is also used in nature with the nervous system. Precisely, that's how transmission of nervous signals is achieved by vesicles through the axons of the neurons. So the ones that I want to discuss and have been discussing are spontaneously formed CMMs. Okay. Now, as I have mentioned already, the, uh, sorry, let me get back to where I was and just a moment, please. I have given very many examples. Let me get back here. Yes. Okay. So, as I have already told you, uh, the first laboratory detection of this spontaneous CMN formation was in the paper by Rustam and all 2004. And there they named them TNT, tunneling nanotubes. I've already shown this picture for the way that they are formed, okay? And I gave an idea of how, what the observed features were. All right. Now, what uh, are the functions of TNTs? Okay. One very important one is the role they play in the immune system. In a paper by Watkins and Salter, 2005, in which they were working with dendritic, dendritic cells, which are very important cells of the immune system that initiate the immune response. So they injected E. coli antigen into a dendritic cell. This is the red arrow. I'm sorry, I, I, I cannot let go here. Just a second, please. Um, let me get back here. Yes. Okay. I think I have to keep this way. So they injected the antigen into a dendritic cell, which is marked with a red arrow in uh, picture one. Okay. Then 
a few seconds later in picture two, you can see that there is a calcium doubly charged ion which is propagating and appears as green fluorescence from that cell to the other cells. Okay. And then you see in picture three that one cell which is marked by these blue arrows uh, is extending a lamellipodium, an extension of the cell membrane and it's moving towards the adjacent cells because you can see the displacement between three and four. Okay. So, these results were taken by the authors to demonstrate that non-neural cells can transmit signals to distant cells through TNTs. And that was a very early hint of a possible connection with between the CMNs and the nervous system. Now, one function which we also detected in our lab is this help and rescue function. And I think I showed this already. This is the case in which, I'm sorry, let me adjust the screen, in which one cell is asking for an app apoptosis signal to a neighboring cell and you can see in the picture that there is a vesicle which is going along this very thin TNT and this uh, was for U87 glioma cells. So, uh, so this is a suggestion that the TNT can be used to intermediate help, in this case by transmitting an apoptosis signal, and this was confirmed by a, a paper later that. Also, we observed in our lab that when you pull on a TNT itself with optical tweezers, and apply an increasing force, you're extracting another nanotube, but beyond the threshold pulling force, it splits into two. That's the I to Y bifurcation. The other function <coughs> is that the cells can help uh, others by transferring proteins or even uh, small, uh, well, uh, they, they can be used to transfer mitochondria, which are essential for cell, cell respiration. And we'll see the examples below in the case of cancer. Okay. Now, the CMNs play important roles in disease. Practically all known types of pathogens opportunistically employ CMN for cell invasion. And, uh, 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 sorry, let me get back here. Ernfeld and others showed that BCG bacteria surf along TNTs between macrophages and then get phagocytosed, transmitting infection. And Dubay and others detected communication among bacteria. I think I mentioned this yesterday, that uh, they allow acquisition of antibiotic resistance. And then flu virus employs TNT for transmission between cells. Retrovirus build CMN bridges for transmitting to other cells. And HIV propagates along T cells through them. Also, I think I mentioned that increases infectivity by orders of magnitude. And prions also hijack TNT for intercellular spread. Now, the TNT network in this case is shown in this picture. You can see 
several TNTs extended among these cells. And this was even, sorry, this was even connect, called the internet of cells. Okay, now let me come to cancer. Okay, here there is a crucial paper by Oswald and collaborators showing that they play a very important role in the propagation of cancer. What they did was to study the development of glioblastomas in the brain, which are regarded as incurable in mouse brains for long periods up to one year. And they detected that there is a growth of cell membrane nanotubes up to 500 meters long, so very much longer than the size of the cell, and with a diameter of about one micro. They named these tumor microtubes and showed that they contain mitochondria, that's the example I mentioned earlier, and microvesicles. And the tips of these microtubes <coughs> were compared by the authors to neuronal growth cones during development, showing, including dendritic arborization. And they invade the normal brain to spread the cancer, and nuclei from cell divisions travel along them. I don't know if you can see this so clearly here. Uh, in the first picture, there are arrows showing the CMNs extending into the normal brain, and the arrowheads show, see, you see here uh, to the right, in the upper one, that you can see the arrows pointing to the nanotubes and the cells of the cancer cells spreading. Then the lower picture, B, shows that nuclei which are marrowed by arrowheads travel along the CMNs. Here you can see this in the second uh, image that after 23 hours, and you can see it in the uh, image below the last, before the last, after 103 hours. Now that paper then explains why, unlike other brain tumors, sorry, uh, unlike other brain tumors, the gliomas become uh, incurable, do not res respond to treatment, either uh, radius or chemical treatment. And you see this here. Uh, the first picture, the upper left, shows a tumor cell which is surrounded by a dashed circle, which was killed. Okay, then after about an hour uh, and a half, you don't see it anymore, but then you see in the, uh, there's an asterisk marked on the third picture to the right that a nucleus translocates using the CMN. You can see it then in the, in the lower left. It goes to the place where the killed cell had been, and that's also marked by the asterisk, and replaces it. So that's why the uh, gliomas resist treatment, because they are used to replace even a killed cell completely. And also in their paper, emphasized the difference between TNTs and tumor microtubes, because they have bigger diameters. However, in a paper that I discussed yesterday, in our lab, 
we had seen that was the first detection we made. Uh, glioblastoma cells forming a network, network, and we measured the uh, TNT, the, the CMNs, and showed that their radii were just like those of TNTs. So this appears to be a contradiction. However, it could be explained possibly because we were doing in vitro experiments differing from in vivo. And another possibility, which I think is more likely, is that the CMNs can assume different forms, even uh, diameters, depending on the environment. Okay. Now, let's talk about the possible different structures of CMN. Well, there is an ultra-structural image of CMNs connecting C cells, which shows that they actually have two different possibilities. Here you see in B and D that the TNTs actually extend from inside the cytoplasm of the left cell to the one of the right cell. But in picture D, you can see that they come very close to the membrane of the other cell, but not touching it. And in C1, on the right, you see because the scale is uh, one micron, that actually the gap uh, at the top is much smaller, and it's just of the right order for a synapse between neurons, which I also showed yesterday. Okay. We continue. Just a second. Okay. Yes, this is what I just said. The synaptic cleft of the order of 0.1 microns. I showed yesterday what is a synapse in neurons. Also, in this picture, D. Let me go a bit uh, up. You can see that was in the study where it was seen in vivo and an inflamed mouse cornea that these CMNs can be very much curved and tortuous, not straight. Okay? That will be very important. Now I compare, I sum this up, comparing the features of the CMN with neuronal axons. First, both the CMN and the neurons are used for transmitting signals between distant cells. Second, they employ calcium signaling, as was shown by Watkins and Salter. And in a paper by Northcutt, they also uh, have voltage-gated sodium channels, which evolved from calcium channels and predated neurons, again, precursor of neurons. Okay, then, item three, there are both electrical and chemical signaling. In the central nervous system, both types are used. There is chemical transmission, with the vesicles containing neurotransmitters and electrical transmission as well by the kind of electrical synapses. Well, the chemical transmission was already found in Rustom's papers, but there is also an analog for CMN of electrical synapses, a gap junction demonstrated in a paper by Wong and collaborators. Okay. In the item four, there are analogs of both axons and dendritic networks, okay? And that appears clearly in the study of glioblastoma that I just shown, where the cancer microtubes tips were compared with neural growth cone tips during development with frequent dendritic arborization. Okay, now, 
There's a role they play in neural development in the paper by Wang and L. They showed that developing neurons establish electrical coupling and exchange calcium signals via TNT. Number six, glutamate signaling. The paper by Huang and Al found that glutamate signaling plays an essential role in cytonin mediated signaling in the development of Drosophila. And finally, one of the most striking uh, results here are synaptic connections, as I mentioned and you saw above, but even more. In this paper by Huang and L, they found the structure of these connections by using what a technique called GRASP, in which there are two complementary fragments of green fluorescent protein attached to different cells. So when a synaptic connection is established, a true synaptic connection, the, uh, you can see this by a green fluorescent signaling, and you can see this here in this picture. Let me get to it. All those asterisks are uh, cases in which there was a synaptic transmission. So, summing this up, you can see by all these arguments that this justifies the uh, hypothesis that the CMNs are the ancestors of the nervous system. Okay, now I come to the part about the origin of life and of eukaryotes. Well, the primordial atmosphere of the Earth did not have oxygen. So it did not have an ozone layer, and this allowed ultraviolet radiation uh, from the sun to uh, uh, bathe land surfaces and render them hostile to light. So plausible origins of hypothesis for the origin of life situate the orange of life very deep in the oceans. In particular, Martin and Russell, a very important paper, proposed that life began at what are called deep ocean hydrothermal vents. They arise really uh, by uh, the effect of uh, in the very deep ocean, uh, the crust and the ocean interact, and this leads to formation of jets, these thermal jets. And up to now, there, there was found, I showed below, these hydrothermal vents contain uh, carbonate mounds very high up to tens of meters tall, which are inhabited by microorganisms that are believed to be representatives of the earliest life forms. So these mounds have a microscopic sponge-like cellular structure, just like a sponge, with metallic catalytic lightings. Through these channels, there is a flow and circulation of seawater. The seawater contains uh, three important gradients, thermal gradients, electrical gradients, and pH gradients. So this whole system behaves like an electrochemical reactor, and that's an ideal hatchery for the origin of cells. In particular, Acetyl thioesters are continuously generated, and these are precisely regarded as precursors of RNA in the widely accepted RNA world model for the origin of cells. Okay, here you see a picture of some of these uh, uh, vents, okay, and in particular one which is called the Lost City event, 
which was discovered in 2000, has a depth of about 800 meters. You see that, as I mentioned, there is a rich uh, variety of these microorganisms, which are of two types. And during the first two billion years after the origin of life, they were the only form of life. And there are two different types, which are actually very different. One is bacteria, which you all know, and the other is called archaea, or originally called archaea bacteria, but they are very different, very different from bacteria. But both of them are prokaryotes. In other words, they don't have nuclei. So, now, how could prokaryotes have originated, particularly the nucleus, and even more important, mitochondria? Well, in the first place, we know that the genetic code is universal. So, this leads to the surmise that both bacteria and RK has a common ancestor from which both originated, which is denoted by the abbreviation LUCA, that's last universal common ancestor. Now, as I mentioned, one difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes is the eukaryotes have nuclei. But the most important difference is that eukaryotes have internal organelles, the mitochondria, and those have their own genomes, which are very small. And they provide them with an independent energy source. And the large ratio of energy per gene in the mitochondria allowed them to increase the complexity of the nuclear genome by many orders of magnitude in comparison with prokaryotes. Now, the origin of eukaryotes is one of the most controversial problems in biology. There's a model by Martin and Muller in which they arose by endosymbiosis between an archaeon, which was the host, which was anaerobic and chemosynthetic methanogen, and the bacterium, an alpha proteobacterium, which was the symbiont, and that's how mitochondria arose. The host used, okay, the host used hydrogen and carbon dioxide to produce methane, and the symbiont was capable of aerobic respiration as well as an anaerobic fermentation, and in the aerobic process expelled hydrogen CO2. Okay, so that was the symbiosis. Then there was a second endosymbiosis with cyanobacterium, which allowed for photosynthesis that gave rise to vegetable cells, photosynthetic. Now, how did this happen? the assumption would be that the bacterium was engulfed by the archaea, which was, and it would be an extremely unlikely event that was supposed to have possibly have occurred only one in the origin of life. And here is the diagram. In one, the host engulfs the protobacterium, and then it leads to the mitochondria seen below and the nucleus. And the second step is after that engulfing a cyanobacterium, which led to chloroplasts and chlorophyll. And uh, okay, that's a vegetable cell. What is the evidence for this model? First, the mitochondria, like the bacteria, have double membranes. Second, the mitochondrial genome is very similar to ba bacterial genome. Third, mitochondria-like bacteria multiply by binary fission. So, the cell nucleus 
would be formed at a later step, and it allowed that most of the bacterium genes migrated to the nucleus, leaving only the very small uh, uh, genes contained in the mitochondria. However, this model had a very serious difficulty. How did this mechanism operate? How was it that the one cell engulfed the other? It looks like phagocytosis, but it could not have been phagocytosis because this required proteins and a lot of energy resources, which the archaea don't have. Okay, now continuing with the story, about five years ago, at a hydrothermal vent in the depths of the Arctic Ocean, ocean were found remains of a previously unknown type of archaean named Lockheed archaean, which seemed to be a missing link between prokaryotes and eukaryotes because it already had some eukaryotic features. And its genome was reconstructed from, well, there was very small uh, sample of sediment, only 10 grams. However, in 2017, the paper said that this was not correct, it contested it, and said this was probably contamination. And now I come to the latest and fantastically beautiful development, which is called uh, the IMACHI experiment. Let me just get there. Okay, this is a Japanese group laboratory. Just a moment. Sorry for the have to reach here. Okay, let me do this now. Okay, going down. All right, just get there. Okay, this appeared in the cover of Nature in a paper that has been enormously uh, quoted already. So what the Machi group did, here is, I'm getting back. This paper was published uh, in, on 20th January, and they report that they have isolated and grown living Loki Archaea cultures. They collected mud, again from dive of a submersible in 2006 into the Omain Ridge 2,500 2, meter deep. And they you try to cultivate the microbes found in these sediments by building a bioreactor that mimicked the conditions precisely of a deep sea methane vent. Okay, now small samples of the collected mud were inserted in glass tubes containing nutrients, as well as antibiotics to eliminate the possible contamination by bacteria. And it took them one year in, to find out by DNA analysis that one of those tubes contained an archaean of what is called the Ar Asgard superphylum, that uh, w where the Lockheed archaea belong. Now this archaean reproduced enormously slowly. It took 14 to 25 days for a single cell division, which compares with a typical 
doubling time of one hour for bacteria. So this is about 500 times slower growth rate. And is one of the reasons why it took about 12 years to complete this work. Okay, then they uh, did repeated subcultures and purifications, gradually enriching, enriching the archaean. The final result was a stable laboratory culture, which is still small, containing only this new lucky archaean and a different methane-producing archaean. And between both, there is a symbiotic relationship. The scientists named the cultured strain lucky archaean Prometheo archaeum centrophicum after the Greek god Prometheus who created humans out of mud. And they verified that it does contain numerous eukaryotic line like genes, but no internal organelles. Now, this was a fantastic achievement. There is this uh, popular movie about the dinosaur park where remains of a dinosaur uh, egg or something were found and then from them and DNA was extracted and so forth. But instead of recreating a dinosaur, what they did was <laughs> much more fantastic than that, recreating something which was at the very origin of life. Now they did uh, the uh, structural observation to find out what the blocky archaean that they developed looks like. And what they found was that the blocky archaean cells are very small micro sort of uh, nanospheres, coxy, where their diameter is about 300 to 750 nanometers, or the average of a fifth 550 nanometers. You'll see this in the pictures. Okay, you look at the figures A, A and B, I'll show it. And a dividing cell developed a ring-like structure around the middle. And the cells produce membrane vesicles, microvesicles, about 50 to 280 nanometers diameter, as well as chains of labs. So, in picture A, you see the uh, Lockyarchaean, a single cell as a caucus. In picture B, you see that uh, the ag aggregated cells are covered with extracellular polysaccharide like materials that are found also now in bacteria. And in C, you see a dividing cell and the constriction in the middle, also forming a polar chain of blebs. So all these things are of extremely ancient origin, like you are at the origin of life. Now, the most important feature for our talk that they detected was the presence of cell membrane nanotubes. They found that the cells form membrane-based nanotubes, both straight and curved and tortuous, and a diameter of 80 to 100 nanometers, which is very close to TNTs, and a variety of lengths. Now, let me get back a little here. And you, you see, well, that is the most important picture, feature to show you. Okay, now look 
at image G. We see here the uh, Lockyerkeian extending very long nanotubes, which here are curved and tortuous. Here you see it extending a straight nanotube, which could be just like a TNT. And here's, here's an ultra-thin section of the same thing. Okay, now, this led them to a proposal to explain the origin of eukaryotes. Okay, prior to this endosymbiosis, the last eukaryotic common ancestor, denoted as Leca, Archaean, very likely interacted with sulfur reducing bacteria and uh, organotrophs that utilize oxygen. The, the ones that utilize oxygen was like a facultative aerobe capable of both aerobic and anaerobic generation of hydrogen. And the sulfur reducing bacteria could scavenge, scavenge the uh, hydrogen from the pre leak archaean and facultatively aerobic partner. One of these partners was likely this pre mitochondrial alpha proteobacterium, PA, is the denotation for fu future mitochondria. Evolution of the symbiosis likely led to the PA and the symbiosis into the pre leak archaean, resulting in a transitional PA containing the pre leak archaean, abbreviated PAPA that used PA both to scavenge oxygen and uh, use it as a building block for uh, providing the symbiont that allowed growth under microaerobic conditions, even without the sulfur reducing bacteria. Now, given the structure of nowadays eukaryotic cells, it is logical to presume that the pre leak archaean engulfed the metabolic partner. And the archaean may have produced protrusions and or microvesicles. So, if you think of an archaean that is growing in a very narrow space, for instance, in, in a pore of the sediment, it may have been possible for the protrusions helped by microvesicles, you'll see this below, to fuse and inadvertently surround the partner. So this is a model of phagoto phagocytosis independent engulfment. And it does not have the difficulties of the previous phagocytosis model. So it would simultaneously assimilate the partner and also it could inside form a chromosome bounding membrane structure. This will be seen below. Topologically similar to that of the eukaryotic nuclear membrane. In this symbiosis, PAPLA and PA both benefit. PAPLA by allowed energy metabolism and indirectly obtaining energy, while the PA fed oxoacids for energy production. So finally, the PAPLA enslaves the PI, and finally you arrive at the LACA, which has symbiosis like that of existing eukaryotes and their mitochondria inside. And they call this sequence of steps for the origin of karyotes in the E3 model from entangle, engulf, and slave. And this is shown in this figure now, which I'll try to show in sequence. It's a very uh, tall figure. In A, you see the Asgard Archaeon with new marked in blue with all those uh, CMNs curved and tortuous. And in uh, violet, you see methanogen, and below we'll see 
the sulfur reducing bacteria with which the symbiosis initially uh, begins. That's figure B, and to the left you see the sulfur reducing bacteria. Now, here inside here you see in red the pre mitochondrial alpha proteobacteria. The arrows uh, are, stand for metabolic exchange. Okay. So there is a parallel interaction with sulfur reducing bacteria and pre mitochondrial alpha proteobacteria. In C, there is a transition to a more aerobic lifestyle and the protrusion. Uh, the vesicle function increases intimacy and you can see that there are vesicles which help with this that stand in between. In D, the pre eukaryotic archaean and finally engulfs the PA and begins to form a nuclear membrane which you see around this blue circle here. Then in E, there is the maturation of the symbiosis by consolidating the metabolism, for instance, switching to bacterial lipids. Okay, so the PA parasitizes the host through uptake of ATP from the host cytosol. In the final picture, the uh, Lapla enslaves the PA, losing catabolism and reverting the <coughs> AC activity. So the final result is uh, this. Parasol. So here you verify the most primitive microorganisms supposed to exist at the origin of life already produced CMMs and that I think is also new very strong evidence for proposing that they are the ancestors of the nervous system. So the final conclusion is to get there. CMMs have existed since the origin of life and they have likely played a crucial role in the origin of eukaryotic cells. Okay, now here I show a picture of a current uh, laboratory. Oh, I, I'm sorry, but it's split. Yeah, you don't see the whole thing really. Let me see. Yeah, it is split. Oh, here, here it is. So here you see on the uh, table the microscope and the laser. This is in our new uh, laboratory, which we moved to very recently, and I can point out some of the collaborators which have names below. This is our theoretician, Professor Paolo Merico Mayanato. Here is uh, an early collaborator who is an expert in microscopy. This is Nathan Bessagiana who takes care of the laser uh, tweezers. And he, this is Bruno Pontes, who was the first author of several of our papers, very, very bright, started as an undergraduate uh, with a lab, and now is a full professor. And, uh, okay, I think the names are above. Yes. These are the names first on the left. The uh, members of the lab that are associated with it, 
uh, professors follow my anatto from Physics Institute, Natan Viana also, Physics Institute, Bruno Portes, which is in the uh, cell biology group, Rafael Dutra, which is at a different university in Rio, Felipe Rosa in our Physics Institute, Susana Frases, Vivaldo Moraneto, which is also, uh, who is also at the Federal University, and Marcos Farina, who is a uh, specialist in microscopy. And we have as collaborators Gert Ingold in Augsburg, Felipe Pinheiro, also in Federal University, Ubira Jaragero in Federal University of Minas Gerais, Nils Gautier in Italy, Ricardo Decca. Uh, in the USA, uh, Dine Ether, who was a PhD student and postdoc in our lab for a long time, very important member of the group, who is currently a uh, postdoc at the University of Texas, Bra Barbara Hissa from Heidelberg, and Luis Pete is also from our federal university. We have as a postdoc Lauber Araujo. Uh, from Biosciences Institute, and to the right you have graduate students for a master's or PhD degree, and there are also currently four undergraduate students. So, that's the end, and thank you very much for your attention. Here are some of our supporters. Thank you. Okay, somebody have some questions? No? No one? Okay. Well, you can address questions to me by email also. What? Any more questions? Okay, I guess no one has. So if not, I'm sorry that I speak with you in person. And uh, I enjoyed my stay with you. So thank you. And okay, thank you, Professor. Yes, we can have a few minutes breaks while Julia is setting up her computer. So see you back in three to four minutes.